Salon, and I'm the remote participation manager for this session. Please note that this session is being recorded and is governed by the ICANN expected standards of behavior. During this session, questions or comments submitted in chat will only be read aloud if put in the proper form as I've noted in the chat. I will read questions and comments aloud during the time set by the chair or moderator of this session. Interpretation for this session will include English, French and Spanish. Click on the interpretation icon in Zoom and select the language you will listen during this session. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand in the Zoom room and once the session facilitator calls upon your name, kindly unmute your microphone and take the floor. Before speaking, ensure you have selected the language you will speak from the interpretation menu. Please state your name for the record and the language you will speak, if speaking a language other than English. When speaking, be sure to mute all other devices and notifications. Please speak clearly and at a reasonable pace to allow for accurate interpretation. To ensure transparency of participation in ICANN's multi-stakeholder model, we ask that you sign in to Zoom sessions using your full name. For example, a first name and last name or surname. You may be removed from the session if you do not sign in using your full name. With that, I will hand the floor over to Eduardo Diaz. Over uh, to you, Eduardo. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, our monthly Narralo meeting and good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone in this uh, global sphere that we live on. Uh, welcome to the March 2022 Monthly North American Regional at Large Organization, or in short, NARRALO. For those of you who are not familiar with this part of the ICANN family, NARRALO is the organization that groups and user organizations and individuals who have engaged to participate in the ICANN policy development process through the at large organization. This meeting is being live streamed to about 11 social channels properties located in Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, some belonging to Narralo itself and others to at-large structures and individual channels. The streaming is done as part of our strategic plan for our reach and engagement in the North American region. Follow us in Twitter at Team Narralo and like us in Facebook groups Narralo to keep abreast with this type of events and other information. Today, we have invited Tom Barrett and Jeff Newman to talk about blockchain, NFTs, and most importantly, the decentralization of domain names and alternate routes that are currently happening with these technologies. Glenn McKnight, who is our secretary, will be the moderator. The idea of this for this presentation happened during the 2021 North American School of Internet Governance, or what we call NASIC, where Tom was one of the professors. Glenn and I thought this conversation was essential to bring it to the ICANN community because of the probably intersection between the decentralized DNS system as we know it and the blockchain decentralized one. By the way, Google NASIC School if you want to know more about it. It is free and open to anyone interested in learning about internet governance concepts. Before we jump to the presentation, bear with us a couple of extra minutes. I am giving the floor to Glenn for a brief intervention on our upcoming elections and then Judith Hellerstein, our non-com liaison, to provide us a quick non-com update. Thank you for your indulgence. And now, Glenn, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, and welcome to the session. Uh, this is Glenn McKnight, uh, uh, Narelle. Uh, Secretariat. So let let us just because this is a, a normal um, Norello meeting, but it's a little bit special because we have to announce our uh, nomination process and 
our um, election coming up. So as you can see in the timetable we provided, and I provided the link in the discussion thread. So we are have um, we're opening up on on March 18th the nomination process. We have a few positions that are open. The chair, uh, which is not term limited, is is available for uh, position. Uh, also, if you go down, you can see the ALAC position. Uh, Marina Mould is not eligible for reappointment, so that position is available. And Judith Hellerstein's position, which is now currently with NOMCOM, is also uh, eligible for reappointment. It's normally a two-year period with NOMCOM because the first year, you just get your feet wet, and by the second year, you're much more of a performer. So uh, we have... Um, uh, process that's available. So if you're interested in, in getting involved with Norello, please uh, check out this page and uh, bear and put in your calendar, the nomination period, you can self nominate or have someone nominate you. So we welcome new blood into the system. And uh, thank you for your time. So back over to Judith to talk about the next uh, part on our agenda, which is NOMCOM. Over to you, Judith. This is Judith Hallerstein for the record. Thank you so much for coming. And, and thank you for all the people who are coming to listen to blockchain, but hopefully we can gather this quick audience, this large audience to really showcase of what we're looking for in the leaders. And here's this chart, um, what we're looking for in a leader. And we really encourage people to come and apply. And um, as you can see, uh, many of the same things that come in uh critical thinking uh cultural awareness uh all these other other different other tactics that you have is that we really need you to come um and um next slide please um the deadline is fast fast approaching we really we have three more days and we really want people to apply. Um, as we noticed, there's been a very, um, uh, a, a, a smaller number of people than usual applying because people are really sick and tired of Zooms and everything, and they don't want to really engage as much if we're gonna be on Zoom. Um, but, uh, but so we really encourage people as we're going for a hybrid, and I can announce that Definitely, we're going to be hybrid. Um, and so there will be an in-person component in The Hague. So we really encourage people to apply. Um, next slide. Um, all the slides will be available. All the slides keep uh, keep going until slide eight. Um, since we have very few, since we want to devote as much time to the thing, we're going to jump through. We're just going to go straight to our summary slide but all the slides are linked to the agenda and they can be have downloaded. So what we're looking for are three members for the ICANN board of directors. Um, one member for the PTI board with the public technical identifiers. Um, we're looking for uh, two reps from North America and Europe. What we mean by is one from North America, which is the US, Canada, any of the te US territories, um, as well as one person from Europe, which is the Uralo region. And so that's two people. Um, and that is for the at-large advisory committee. On the NAMCOM site, they will have all the information on there um, of what you need to do and timing and how much time you need to devote to, um, to the at-large. If you choose this one, if you choose the board, there's time listings of how much time you need to apply, spend on whether your board of directors, board of directors are paid, PTI or not, and the other ones are not. Um, we are also looking for one member of the GNSO council, and that could be from any geography, other areas. And um, last one, they also looking one member of the CCNSO, and that also can be from any any of the geography of diversity. The only ones that are limited for diversity issues are the at-large, where we're, right now 
we have five members who come on ALAC who are appointed by NAMCOM. But this year, since we do staggered terms, we are only looking for two. Um, and so uh, I wanted to post up, there's a slide which has the, uh, the uh, um, link for NAMCOM. Um, so if you want to post that, I think maybe it's the next slide. Yes. And so here is how you can learn more about these positions. And we can post it in the chat as well. And so thank you so very much. And remember, March 11th, three days, 2359 UTC. Thank you so Thanks much. So thank you so much, Judith. Uh, Glenn, uh, take it and let's go to the presentation. Thank you, Judith and Glenn. Glenn, this is Isham, you're muted. It automatically muted, I apologize. Okay, so the title as we indicated, at large Norello, blockchain NFTs and decentralized domains. What is the impact on the end users, internet security, stability and ICANN? As our Norello chair at the beginning, he indicated he was impressed with Tom Barrett's knowledge on the subject matter back when we did our NASIC back in November. And we look to, to complement uh, Tom's session to our new, one of our newest members of our unaffiliated membership in Norello. We looked to Jeff Newman, who was uh, a co-host of a session we did last month. And, and Jeff and Tom are a great team. And together, um, Jeff has Tom's nemesis and, and together they're prepared to make magic together. So I'm looking forward to the session. Now, as critical as the title indicates, it's the importance of understanding to the ICANN end user community, the relationship of blockchain and NFTs to the ICANN uh, situation and the obvious ICANN's mandate to preserve security and stability of the domain system. Our speakers today are eager to start and will be commencing with a series of very short polls and we'll be concluding with a few more. Depending on how things go today, we will be entertaining some questions and I'm sure we'll get to it and we'll be monitoring the chat as we go along. And when there's natural transitions for sections, we'll try to slip in the most logical questions. Uh, we will also like to request folks to post their valuable resources to the chats. If they know of studies, reports, please post it to the chat and we can share this as collaborative notes. So at this point, uh, we're already posted and I'll do it again. Uh, instead of doing a long introduction of our two uh, speakers today, I've been posting the LinkedIn connections to their background. So again, thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Thanks, Glenn. And, and thanks, everyone, for, for joining us today. Uh, if we can right, go to the next slide, what we'd like to do first is just to get a sense of how many of you are active in this space uh, in terms of, uh, and so we have three polls here that we're going to ask our or I can staff to put up. The first one is going to be how many of you actually own cryptocurrency? And so your choices are, I don't own anything. I do, but it's just one currency. It could be Bitcoin or Ether, or you have more than one currency, or I do not know what cryptocurrency is. So we're going to give you five seconds to pick one of those uh, and I'm sorry we don't have uh, heck no, just no. <laughs> heck no. All right, uh, three seconds, two seconds, one second. So submit your answers. Let's take a quick look at uh, the results. All right, so 64% do not own cryptocurrency, 13% own one and then another 21%. So roughly, again, a third of you own cryptocurrency, two thirds don't. So I think we, we can pretty much tell how the next questions will go, but let's just go ask the second question. How many of you own a hardware wallet? This is my, here's a hardware wallet. It's called a ledger. I also have a treasure. Uh, so you use these to, to maintain your digital assets. 
You could also do a hot wallet. So say either, yes, I own a hardware wallet. No, I do not. Or what is a hardware wallet? So those are your three choices. We'll give you three seconds. How many of you own one of these hardware wallets? And I would hope a third of you who own cryptocurrency have a hardware wallet, but it's possible you do everything in the cloud. So can we see the results? All right, so again, 60%, so very good. Pretty close to the, the 20 plus percent that own crypto. You're smart enough to, to keep it in this hardware wallet. Again, you can buy one of these off of uh, Amazon for $100. Uh, I suggest if you really want to keep them secure, you use something called a multi-signature wallet um, for, for, for pretty valuable assets you might have. So we're going to talk more about wallets in a second. Third question, how many of you own one or more NFTs? Could be a bored ape, could be a crazy cat, crypto punk, we don't know. But uh, either say no, yes, or I do not know what an NFT is. Again, three seconds, real quick. How many of you own an NFT? Three, two, one, let's, let's see the results. All right, so we have 10% of you, excellent, who own an NFT. 75% do not. And again, 15% do not know what an NFT is. So we're going to try to help answer some of the, uh, uh, educate you a little bit about NFTs and wallets today, because uh, that's pretty key to understanding uh, decentralized domains, which are simply another type of, of NFT. Uh, so let's go to the next slide, which is our agenda slide. We, we do want to make this interactive, as Glenn said. Uh, so feel free to, to put questions in the chat. Uh, that would be ideal. We also could, uh, you could raise your hand when we're, we open up the floor to questions. Uh, but we're going to try to go through these different sections uh, in our presentation. And again, we will pause after each section to see if uh, there are any questions that we should answer immediately. But we, hopefully you have, um, uh, we have, we have a, a lively discussion as we go through this. And so I'm going to hand this off to Jeff to do an introduction to NFTs and decentralized domains. Thank you, uh, Tom. And, and that was really interesting about um, the poll. And, and it's kind of what I thought. Actually, some more people than I thought owned cryptocurrency, but the NFT ownership was, was just about where I thought it would be. Um, before uh, I start, I just want to say that I'm going to be very, very, very general in this overview. There is a lot more complexity to all of these topics, but just to give everyone a general overview of what we're talking about as um, in terms of blockchain, cryptocurrency, and then ultimately uh, decentralized domains. So in order to understand how NFTs work in decentralized domains and cryptocurrency, you need to understand the concept of blockchain because all of those technologies are based off of the blockchain. And this is a term you hear all the time and um, often undefined uh, in undefined ways and, and it's very kind of amorphous. So a blockchain in its very general Lives terms is a tamper-proof distributed ledger of transactions that are linked together through complex mathematical algorithms. You'll hear that referred to as a hash. Um, the important aspects of a blockchain is that it's decentralized, so there's no one entity that controls the uh, all of the transactions. And the other critical component that we'll talk about several times is that everyone has access to the ledger and each transaction is irreversible. And so when we talk about the applications, all of these factors will be very important. Um, if we go on to the next slide. So one of the best ways to understand blockchain is to talk about the first application of blockchain, which was uh, Bitcoin, but I'm gonna just refer to currency here in general, just so you can understand uh, why cryptocurrencies, whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, or any other coin that's out there, 
has value and, and why, you know, what is this whole craze? So in order to understand the value of this cryptocurrency, you have to take a step back and think about what is money, right? You know, so, so everyone has uh, some of it that they use to buy whatever it is. But in general, money is a value that's accepted by everyone as a form of payment. So money itself, meaning the, you know, bills that it's printed on uh, or, or anything else, yeah, they have a number on it, but the money itself has no value in and of itself. The only thing that gives money any value is the fact that governments or a centralized authority recognize that it's got value. So for a $10 US bill, um, you know, technically the paper that it's on is worth the exact same as a $1, $100, $1,000 bill. But because it's got that number on it, and because the government has declared the value of that as being a specific value, that's why it is worth something. And as, uh, as in the chat, yes, money, in order to have faith in money, you have to have faith in a government. Um, money centralized, as we were talking about, so it's controlled by the government and your individual accounts are controlled by banks. Um, and you have no say in what the value of that money is. In other words, yes, if it says $10 on it, it's going to be worth $10. But what we, but what we mean when we say this is if the government decides to print more money, um, which could lead easily to inflation, then the value of that $10, meaning what you can buy with that actual $10, drops. Um, your purchasing power gets reduced by uh, things that are way outside of your control. Um, in addition, there's lots of fees with, uh, that come with money. So when you go from uh, the United States to Canada or Canada to the United States, not only do you have to exchange it for your money for the other currency, but you usually have to pay a middleman to, for that, that right to have that money. Uh, so you're paying all of these, these fees. So the last thing about money is that your, all of your transactions that you conduct are controlled by your bank or your banks if you have money in multiple banks. But the banks closely guard that ledger so that no one else can see it. You have no idea what's on the ledger of that bank, except as you are provided insight into that ledger by your bank and only with respect to you. So there's no way that someone else other than the bank can verify the money you have in a bank or any transaction you conduct. So, so now with all of that in mind, let's introduce the cryptocurrency. So cryptocurrency, is a digitized form of money or value. It's decentralized, so it doesn't rely on any one bank or any government. The ledger, as with all blockchain technologies, is publicly available to everyone in the network. Um, and, and let me just say a note about that, because that sounds a little scary. Well, what do you mean the ledger is available to everyone in the network? Does that mean everyone knows the exact amount of money that I have or that other people have? And the answer is no. It's, on, it's in a, and I always say this word wrong, pseudonymous, I hope I said that right, format, which means that every transaction is recorded on the blockchain. And so you know that the transaction took place and you know that it's someone with a very long string ID, but you have no idea who that person or organization is that transacted it. Um, so that's why it's called pseudonymous, but everyone on the blockchain has access to the fact that a transaction took place. Um, it's protected against inflation, meaning that um, the supply of the coin is limited so that um, it's, it's it's protected against things like having more money printed, which would lead to inflation and a devaluation of the money. Um, and then there is something called the no double spending problem, 
uh, which essentially means that it, although it's a digital file and all the you technically you can copy any digital file, it's got built in mechanisms to make sure that the money that you use can only be used once and it can't be used um, by a, a multiple occasions. So that's, that's what's referred to as um, the double spending problem or no double spending problem. Um, and, and that's key in, in cryptocurrencies. So all of the transactions are stored on blockchains um, and um, because they're on the blockchains, oops, sorry about that. Someone was trying to call me from Zoom, which is interesting. Um, but um, because they're all on the blockchain, uh, they are uh, not only um, the, the transactions are viewable, but they are irrefutable or um, they're irreversible is what other people um, have worded it. So that's a little bit about uh, blockchain currencies. Um, there's a lot more discussion uh, about the complexities, about how um, blockchains and, and Bitcoins are produced. I'm not gonna go into that amount of detail and the mathematical algorithms, although we'll talk a little bit about it on the next slide, because if you look at the diagram on the next slide. So yeah, so, so with Bitcoin, right? A transaction, so you purchase something with uh, a Bitcoin. That transaction is then transmitted to a network of peer-to-peer -peer computers scattered all around the world. The network of computers then solves mathematical equations to confirm that the transaction is valid. And we could probably spend um, a, a whole bunch of uh, time talking about that. It is incredibly complex, but just know that there are lots of computers out there that validate transactions by solving mathematical equations. And then once your transaction is confirmed to be legitimate, they are clustered together into blocks, and then the blocks are all chained together on this blockchain um, so that all of the transactional history is permanent. So that's just a kind of a diagram of how Bitcoin works. Uh, if we go to the next slide. So then there's a concept you probably have heard a lot about, and uh, it should not be confused with either the blockchain or NFTs, although NFTs do contain smart contracts and smart contracts are stored on the blockchain, but they are not synonyms for each other. They are different things. The other important thing to understand before I describe what is a smart contract, you have to understand that a contract does not always mean an agreement. In other words, just because something is called a contract doesn't mean it is a written agreement. Um, and I know that there's confusion out there where um, you know, I've, I've even heard lawyers asking um, when, when information has been submitted through a smart contract or a transaction has been done through a smart contract, I have sometimes gotten the question of, okay, great, but where's the legal agreement? Or where's the written agreement? And oftentimes with smart contracts, there are no written agreements. So if a smart contract is not a legal agreement, then what is it? Well, a smart contract is just the term for computer code or program stored on a blockchain that runs when predetermined conditions are met. In other words, it's self-executing. And I'll go into an example um, in a second. And, and Mark Trachtenberg just said that smart contracts are written, but it's written in code. That's true. Um, it, it just does not, does not necessarily have all of the legal boilerplate necessarily. Um, but we can talk about that more in a minute. So um, a smart contract automates the execution of an agreement so that all participants can be immediately certain of the outcome without having an intermediary involved or time that's lost. So uh, as I was just saying, smart contracts do not always have legal text-based contracts behind them. So what's an example of a smart contract? So I offer or I lease my Tesla, and that's a picture of it right there, uh, to Tom for 0.37 ETH, that's a form of currency uh, per month. That At least as of when I wrote this slide, that was about $1,000 US dollars a month. I don't know what's happened in the last couple of days. So um, that may have the worth may have gone up or down. I don't know. 
But so long as Tom pays me that 0.37 ETH by the first of the month, then the digital key that I've created for the Tesla will allow him to keep driving it. If for whatever reason, uh, I don't get that 0.37 ETH by the first of the month, well, then the digital key gets revoked and Tom can't drive it. So it, it doesn't involve Tom having to go to a car dealership. Um, it doesn't have Tom have to go to a car rental place. Uh, there's no exchange of paperwork other than um, what was done in this transaction. And so for all of those reasons, for uh, anonymity, for all sorts of other things, um, this transaction is um, completed. And uh, Frank says, yeah, what about insurance? And that's a great point because from the way that Tom drives, um, I need to actually have a guarantee that he's got insurance, but that can also be done uh, through a smart contract where uh, Tom can submit the information of his insurance. Okay, <laughs> next slide. So the, an NFT, so what is an NFT? So an NFT is a non-fungible token, which doesn't help most people understand what a, <laughs> an NFT is because not many people know what a non-fungible token is. So um, a non-fungible means that um, uh, there's a, a, it means that it is unique and that it cannot be traded for something of equal value. Uh, a token is is uh, a um, a token is a digital um, a digital signature of or cert digital certification of ownership. So put together, an NFT is a unique digital asset that represents real world objects like art, music, in game items, and videos. So anyone that's played, let's say. Candy Crush, and uh, that purchases um, uh, in-game items from Candy Crush, like uh, those cool little clusters that blow everything up. In theory, that is uh, a form or could be considered a form of an NFT. So each NFT has a unique digital signature, and it can only have one owner at a time. And again, the token part of the NFT is what implies ownership over that, uh, whatever is put in or associated with that token. And of course, NFTs exist on the blockchain. So in that um, example in the slide, uh, you'll see that one of the most expensive, not the most expensive, that was uh, the, the most expensive one was actually a little bit earlier this year, I think, um, or maybe late last year. But this one here was, is called Human One. And that achieved about $29 million in an auction at Christie's. And so as, as incredible as that is, this only exists in digitized forms and it can only be off, it can only be owned by one person. Yes, in theory, anyone can copy that digital file as I just copied here and put it on the slide, but it is only technically owned. That work of art is only owned and can only be owned by one person and that ownership is validated through the nft on that particular blockchain so if we go to the next slide nfts have historically been thought of as only works of art or music or um, uh, other kinds of tangible items but more recently nfts have been used as um, access or was providing access to certain services or like a digital ticket. So if you look here on the slide, the NFL launched a league-wide NFT, NFT tickets with Ticketmaster so that not only did you technically um, own a copy of this work of art, uh, and I'm being very specific of the terms I use, you own the copy of the work of art, not necessarily the work of art itself, um, that not only do you own that, but you use that as your ticket to get into specific NFL games. Um, and another thing I just read recently about 
was uh, rapper Post Malone is planning to launch a celebrity beer pong league that uh, anyone can participate in so long as you have an NFT, a specific type of NFT, which provides you the access to that beer pong tournament. Uh, of course, I am not going to be participating in that because I do not drink and I think um, I would lose very quickly. But I can think of many people uh, in, in this community that would probably be very good at this uh, particular service. So the main point of this slide is, is not to talk about beer pong, but to point out that new uses of NFTs are um, uh, arising on a daily basis or hourly basis. Um, NFTs, uh, I also saw that um, um, there uh, are certain celebrities, uh, especially in the hip hop community, that own virtual real estate. So this only exists in the digital world. Um, very expensive. And if you wanted to purchase a plot of digital land next to these celebrities, you could buy an NFT to purchase that uh, plot of land for uh, close to a million dollars. So NFTs um, are, are uh, or can be incredibly valuable and um, new uses of it are coming up every day. So with that, I think that's my last slide. I could turn it over to Tom to uh, Jeff, talk can, about. Yep. Jeff, can, can I, um, before we go to, um, to Tom, uh, Jonathan had a question that I think is applicable to your last slide. He says, so does the person get the copyright to the image, the ability to license it. So I just need, I think we need to clarify that because we jumped ahead on that. Yeah, so um, I, I wish this was a quick answer. Um, it is still, uh, there's a lot of debate within the legal community. Um, so the answer as Mark put up, there, put up there is it depends. The hmm. only thing for certain that you own uh, by purchasing an NFT is you own the copy of what you bought. Um, whether you own the work of art itself uh, is really dictated by the terms and conditions that underlie the um, purchase of that NFT. Uh, and so those can be in the form of self-executing smart contracts or they can be supported in um, traditional legal based contracts, but it, that is certainly a question that's being debated by the legal community, as well as can terms embedded in an NFT or a smart contract, is that legally enforceable? Uh, most courts have hinted, even if they haven't necessarily um, resolved that, uh, to just saying that so long as the transaction follows the traditional contract rules, meaning there's um, offer acceptance and consideration that traditional contract law will in fact apply. So it's, it's not an easy question. It's a great question, um, but uh, one that is uh, not an easy answer. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, back over to Tom. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Glenn. And, and yeah, fantastic overview, uh, Jeff. And, and again, hopefully if, if anyone still thinks a, a NFT, for example, is just a, a JPEG, uh, that you can do a, a right mouse click on there. It's going. It's moving well, way, way beyond uh, online art, and uh, there's all kinds of innovation, innovative uh, uses of of NFTs. Um, so what I'm going to try to do now is to give you, again, it's my personal opinion on. on there's all these uh, things happening, and where do I think it's going? We keep seeing different names, metaverse, and decentralized web. Uh, and so I'd like to get give you an idea of where I think all this is headed. And so if we go to the next slide, uh, you've heard about cryptocurrency, you've heard about NFTs. Uh, these are disrupting some pretty major parts of the economy. We're going to have decentralized finance. We're going to have supply chain tracking to uh, combat uh, counterfeiting. Uh, we're going to have blockchains focused on uh, medical information. We're going to have blockchains focused on real estate, actual physical real estate. And so I see all of these different technologies 
coalescing around what we call the decentralized web. And so this is where we, we start to get into, you know, the ICANN realm. And so uh, if we go to the next slide, I think the way I would sum up what is the decentralized web all about? What is driving it? It's, it's basically by this uh, now a cliche, if you're not paying for a product, you are the product. And so it's this sense that consumers and individuals have essentially lost control of their personal information and their privacy when they go on the internet today. And so where I think this is going, if we go to the next slide, is a term called self, you know, there's basically this backlash against privacy. And what we see are a, a grassroots movement, so to speak, to regain control of your personal privacy. And that is where I think the decentralized web is going. Uh, and so in that context, um, what, how will that end up? If you go to the next slide, you know, we've talked about uh, the, the hardware wallet. We asked you up front, to just, who owns a hardware wallet? And, and today, these hardware wallets are used to own Bitcoin, to control the keys to Bitcoin, or the keys to an NFT, be it a piece of artwork or, or music or some other sort of NFT. But in the future, I also see these wallets as controlling your personal information, right? This is your identity wallet. And as you go on the internet and visit various sites, you will be in control of your personal information and decide who and when you want to share that and when you want to revoke access to, to, that, uh, to that site that you're visiting in the metaverse. And so uh, you've heard about censorship. It's, it eliminates censorship because it's immutable, meaning it's irreversible. You own it. No one can take it away from you. Uh, it's anonymous if you choose to be. And it's actually enabled by some new technologies uh, that combine DNSSEC and another DNS standard called DANE that allows you to basically self-certify your identity without using a third-party digital certificate. In the end, it will eliminate all the intermediaries out there that can sniff your data. I'm talking about Web2 browsers, social media, ISPs, third-party certificate authorities like Let's Encrypt or GeoTrust, and even ICANN and the contracted parties who collect your personal data, publish it into a WHOIS database, and are, make sure you're, you're subject to takedown policies. So that's where I think the decentralized web is going to, are these self-sovereign digital identities. Next slide. And as these consumers move to this new decentralized web, brands obviously are going to follow them, just like they followed consumers to social media. And so there has been a spike in trademark filings by brand owners everywhere, all over the world. In the US alone, uh, trademarks related to NFTs went up 400 times for 2021. This is a headline from just a week or so ago. In China, uh, again, not to be outdone, uh, they've got 16,000 new filings just related to the metaverse. So trademark owners or brand owners realize this is where the web is going and they wanna make sure they're able to follow those consumers to social media, uh, to the uh, decentralized web. Uh, next slide. So as it turns out, if you have a, a self-sovereign digital identity and you want to share it with someone else, it's fairly yeah. hard to do that with these long cryptographic addresses. And so the decentralized web needs domain names. And so they're using what we call alternative routes or non ICANN TLDs in order to enable domain names on the decentralized web. And it's not, they're doing this not just because ICANN is slow to launch the next round, but because the whole concept of self-sovereign identity is simply incompatible with the ICANN policies about disclosing your personal information. And so 
I see this resulting in two separate internets served by two different types of technologies. Next slide. And one more point here is I see this resulting a what I call a third browser war. The first one occurred back in the late 90s between Mosaic, which is really the first web browser, and Microsoft Explorer. Uh, Microsoft Explorer was the victor in that first war. Uh, and by 2001, pretty well dominated the browser space. It, it was uh, it maintained that position till Google came out with Chrome, probably in 2008. And again, these new browsers obviously supported new features uh, that uh, made the user experience more enjoyable. And certainly by 2015, uh, Chrome was now dominating the web browser space. And this is important because the browser obviously is what most consumers use to access the internet. And I see there be a third browser war, uh, which will not include any of the web two browsers, but will be browsers like Brave, Puma, Opera, or Beacon. And so these browsers will basically be, have embedded in them, the wallets I talked about, where you can have the keys to your currency, the keys to your personal data. It will have DNSSEC and Dane enabled. And so you don't need to rely on third party digital certificates to encrypt your data. And it will allow you basically to decide when and where you share your personal information. Next slide. So we'll, we'll pause there, Glenn, if you've got any questions on that before we, we jump into implications for internet security. Yeah, we have a ton of great discussion and, and some people are generous in their time and, and expertise, and, but maybe I can, I can pick up the last uh, question. I can't pull them all up, but there's a question, let's just see here. Uh, do, 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 sorry about this. Uh, too many things open. Okay, comes from Tracy Proctor. Question, what would you suggest for a brand wanting to use Punico domains? An ICANN proxy redirect, HNNS.TO, or teaching users to resolve fingertip slash Bob or something else? So uh, that, that, that's a great question. I, I actually have a slide later um, and I'll refer to it now. So the decentralized web is not a complete solution today. Right, where if, if, if you ever heard of Jeffrey Moore's crossing the chasm, we are before the chasm. We're in the early adopter space where these solutions are very incomplete. And so there are uh, plugins that you can add to web two browsers. You, you mentioned a few of them here, Fingertip, which is from a Handshake, from the Handshake developer community uh, that allows you to take a web two browser and basically all, what it's basically doing is bypassing the ICANN route, bypassing the public suffix list and relying on handshake as, as your public suffix list to navigate the decentralized web. And so you can certainly have a, uh, if you wanted to do a brand pony code or otherwise, those are available now on handshake. And by the way, handshake's not the only alternative namespace out there, but certainly we're going to talk more about it in a second. Um, but you can do a, a IDN brand name in Handshake and again, direct your target market to the compatible web browsers that support that, that particular alternative route. Okay, Anything great. Else? Great, thank you. Uh, Siva has a question. His hand is up, but he hasn't typed it in the, um, into the box. So we'll have to follow up with him when he posts it. So back over to you and in, in the third item. Great, thank you everybody. And these are great questions. Uh, we'll have hopefully more time at the end as well to cover some of them. I'm gonna hand this over to, to Jeff to talk about some of the implications for internet security and stability. Okay, thanks Tom. Uh, and so I've already seen, if we go to the next slide, I've already seen a bunch of um, comments uh, kind of, uh, 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 anticipating what we're 
going to be discussing. So um, we'll get into a, a lot of that uh, as, as uh, in these next few topics. So to, to understand ICANN's view on alternate routes, you have to go back to um, really 2001, uh, although the technical community had been talking about that prior to 2001. But in 2001, in July of 2001, ICANN posted what they call ICP3, a unique authoritative route for the DNS. Um, it is a um, fairly lengthy paper, um, but uh, I strongly encourage everyone to go back and read that. The link is here. But essentially, this paper affirms ICANN's commitment to a single authoritative public route for the internet domain name system. And later on, in its, ICANN states that its mandate is to preserve stability of the DNS required, or, or sorry, preserving stability of the DNS requires that it avoids encouraging the proliferation of alternate routes that could cause conflicts and instability and then even later on in the paper, it says alternate routes inherently danger DNS stability. So why, why do they make these statements? Um, and I can't remember if I did this in another slide. Do I have another slide on this? Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so what does I can't say that the consequences of alternate routes are? Um, the first one is, well, if you have alternate routes existing with the one authoritative route, then it is possible that the DNS will provide the wrong location um, for, you know, what, where you're trying to, uh, to go. Lo que so, se puede tratar de hacer es ver o ir a una, a una URL, en este caso, si uno va a... The way that DNS was built, you end up going to the wrong computer. Um, in other words, URLs no longer have that, quote, uniform in the uniform resource locator. Um, the consequences would be unpredictable to most users. Uh, intermediate hosts add to the confusion because Internet service providers uh, or sorry, because Internet services are often dependent on action of uh, DNS resolvers. And we saw that. Um, not necessarily with uh, an alternate route, but we saw that with SiteFinder in 2003, where um, changes were made to the top level uh, name servers that um, were of a different, that caused a different response than what had been expected. And that caused a lot of confusion with a number of services that were um, depending on the uh, top level domain name servers responding in a certain way. Um, cache poisoning is something that uh, this paper points out, which means that activities by those intending to use the authoritative route could be misdirected by records in the alternate route. And there is an RFC that was drafted by the Internet Architecture Board, RFC 2826, that talks about the technical issues um, or it talks about the support for a unique DNS route and the technical issues that could arise uh, if we um, encourage the proliferation of alternate routes. So that has been historically ICANN's position on alternate routes. Um, I will state that it, it, history shows that we've had alternate routes in the past before. So in the late 1990s, early 2000s, you had um, something called the Atlantic route. You had, um, and I'm forgetting what Chris Ambler called his uh, dot web, but it was uh, also an alternate route. There was then in 2001, or maybe it was 2000, uh, something called real names that essentially operated as an alternate route. Um, and since then there have been other alternate routes that have come and most of them have, either not succeeded because of um, the uh, non-acceptance of browsers and other um, internet service providers, but some of them um, are still in existence for the limited purpose for which they were created. 
Uh, technically, private networks could be considered, quote, alternate routes, but those are accepted forms of alternate routes where you have a um, private network that's set up in between, within a company or within a few companies. Um, so an example of that is uh, one way that uh, what's called IXPs, uh, carriers in Europe, exchange information is through a private enum alternate route network, uh, but it's closed and it's um, very specific. Now, uh, it could be affected if I can were to ever adopt a TLD that uses the same extension that they use. Uh, but at this point, it is a private alternate route that exists in its own kind of um, network, closed network. So um, ICANN has actually been fairly silent about on alternate routes for a number of years up until very recently with a um, blog post where um, ICANN has um, basically issued a uh, warning to users or buyers uh, of um, alternate domain, uh, alternate root domain names, um, stating that um, consumers should be aware that those domains that they purchase may not work on all applications, may not work within their browsers without downloading a plugin, et cetera. So um, up until that point, uh, ICANN had been very silent on alternate routes with the exception of ICP3 in 2001 and um, uh, until this blog post. So I'll turn it over to Tom now to talk about some interesting questions that all of uh, these alternate routes raise. Thanks, Jeff. As Jeff said, uh, alternate routes have always been around since 1995. Uh, they certainly have not seen uh, a large uh, degree of success, but they also haven't broken the internet, so to speak. And so this is a great quote from Paul Vixie, a little bit out of context, he was referring to the, uh, the, his attempts to do some experimentation with IPv6 and, and DNSSEC at the time. Uh, but this is the general attitude, certainly, that uh, the, the alternate root name service is the third rail of internet governance. If you touch it, you die. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind uh, in terms of context. Uh, so how, what does this mean? Why, why do we bring this up for the, in terms of the, the decentralized web? So let's go to the, the next slide. So as it turns out, uh, alternative routes are proliferating everywhere, right? Blockchains, as I mentioned, need domain names in order to give user-friendly identifiers to wallets and websites, et cetera. Uh, we've already heard about uh, Bitcoin, which is what the first blockchain Ethereum is more of a general purpose blockchain. And it came out, these are just four examples. There are many more. Uh, I want to highlight these four to give you some, a little bit of perspective. The Ethereum naming service is, again, its own sort of ecosystem for building its own decentralized web outside of ICANN. They launched Got ETH as their first TLD. And then they decided, you know what, we'll stop here. It just so happened to be a reserved uh, string by ICANN. And uh, we're going to just focus on being complementary to the ICANN route and try to enable people with .coms or .nets or .bank domain names. If they want to be integrated into Ethereum, then we will enable that sort of integration. And so we have seen that, for example, .lux, .xyz, .cred, .art, Several of the ICANN TLDs have, have experimented with integrating their ICANN TLD into an Ethereum, the Ethereum naming service. Solana is a more recent entry, another new blockchain, again, launched a TLD for its ecosystem. Uh, Unstoppable Domains is an interesting, in the sense that it's not, it's not specific for a blockchain. Um, they just went into business, a commercial for-profit business, to sell second level names. They started on the Ethereum naming service that allowed them to essentially piggyback off of the ecosystem that the Ethereum naming service had built around .eth. Uh, it turned out gas fees or transaction fees 
uh, became unsustainable, as many of you may know. And so they actually moved off of Ethereum to the Polygon blockchain last summer. So very nimble. Uh, and because they're not really investing in the blockchain, underlying blockchain itself, they're able to devote much more of their budget to marketing and business development. So they're, they're, they're very well run from a marketing perspective. However, the, the move from Ethereum to Polygon also meant that they lost access to that huge ecosystem that had been built around .eth. And so instead of having 100 compatible wallets for .crypto, you might be down to 20 or 30 compatible wallets for .crypto. So those examples are second level names, Tom.crypto, Jeff.crypto. The handshake naming service is really represents the, the model for the decentralized web because they're focused on open sourcing the ICANN route itself. So top level domains. Uh, next slide. So when we talk about, uh, there, there's certainly potential for abuse here with these alternative routes. Jeff went into some of them. Um, the Ethereum naming service is a nonprofit. Uh, they're trying to do what's called a decentralized autonomous organization. It's just launched in November. So we received some airdrops as part of that, which gives us these tokens to vote in a democracy type of environment for what the, the various policies they want to adopt for ENS. Fairly weak on the right protection front, uh, but despite uh, very high gas fees, they're still on what's called proof of work. They're at 750,000 second level names under .eth. If you look at the, the scoreboard or leaderboard for the new ICANN TLDs, that would put them right in the top 10 and still growing rapidly. Unstoppable domains, again, selling second level names for 10 generic strings. Uh, unlike .eth, those will likely have collision potential in the next ICANN round. Uh, they have tried to prevent trademark infringement by reserving the top 100,000 websites and also the ICANN route. <clears throat> but again, about 2 million second level names. And that, as I said, Handshake is a little more interesting because they're focused at the top level. Uh, again, they're trying to, to disintermediate ICANN and its regulations. They're trying to disintermediate certificate authorities. They also reserve the ICANN route and top 100,000 websites, but that's temporary, right? And so that's not going to be forever. They've already registered three and a half million top level domains, uh, 1,400 of which are selling second level names. And uh, we, and Surfer actually supports those. So if you're interested in seeing the list, you can visit our website. Uh, they're even selling, uh, as I ex ex will explain in a second, they're selling TLDs that you would not see ever in an ICANN route. We go to the next slide. <clears throat> so I call Handshake the, the democratization of top level domains. Whereas the entry fee to, uh, for ICANN is $185,000, the entry fee in Handshake is less than the cost of a Starbucks coffee. So you can get your self-sovereign digital identity that I talked about before. You can get a community TLD. You can get a dot brand TLD. And uh, I do have dot and circa currently on handshake and I do not anticipate applying in the next ICANN round. I'll simply develop uh, on the alternative route. Next slide, please. So when Handshake launched, it was about two years ago, they have what I would call a sunrise period. That's not what they called it. But uh, basically they did reserve the ICANN route as of February, 2020, and the top 100,000 names. And they said, we'll hold these for four years. That's their sunrise period. So they're more than halfway through that sunrise period at the end of which hey, they will- Hey, Tom. Yeah. Can I just, uh, this is Jeff, can I just, um, when, when you say reserve the ICANN route, there were some questions in the chat. Can you just, um, 
explain what you mean when you say that something's res- that someone that handshake reserved the ICANN route? Yeah, great, great question. So they the handshake, as you'll see in a second, wants to be a mega route, a super route. They want to be backward compatible, uh, but but they only can be backward compatible as of in this in this instance, February twenty twenty. So what they said is, you know, we will reserve the current ICANN route. And the only ones, the only parties that can claim those ICANN TLDs that we have reserved in Handshake are the current registry operators that that own them or control them in the ICANN route. And so there's a there's a DNSSEC claiming process for both reserved ICANN TLDs, both GTLDs as well as CCTLDs as well as uh, if you happen to own a domain, the top 100,000 list, in this case, generated by Alexa, you also can claim your corresponding domain name as a top level domain in the handshake, uh, in the handshake route. And uh, it does require DNSSEC. Um, it does require the uh, DNSSEC SHAR 256 or higher. And so we re- recently ran into a situation with a CCTLD that we were helping to claim their handshake TLD, and they were using SHA-1. Well, that's been deprecated, as you know, by the internet community. So they had to go through a process of upgrading their DNSSEC in order to claim their TLD in handshake. Same problem, you know, we're working with another client who has a, a name on this top 100,000 list. They don't use DNSSEC today. They need to add DNSSEC in order for to in order to initiate the claim process for these reserved names. So after reserving those uh, those hundred thousand plus strings, uh, they went into what I call general availability auctions. These are auctions that for any available string that anyone can initiate and anyone can participate in. So they're public auctions. Uh, it, had, it, it has its usual mix of early adopters and speculators. There are certainly some bad actors in here, as, as we've seen everywhere. So we see some trademark infringement and homographs. A homograph is a TLD, such as, you know, instead of .com, .com, you see .c, 0m. Obviously, confusingly, you know, intended to confuse people who have a .com. And it does ignore... Uh, the traditional list of ICANN reserved strings and, and various restrictions on uh, emo- emojis, for example, which are freely available under Handshake. Next slide. So I want to give you an idea of what happened when they launched two years ago, February 2020. They started at zero. The first month, they delegated over 3,000 TLDs. So they, the first month, they were twice the size of the ICANN route, which currently sits at 1,500 TLDs. After one year, they're at 500,000 TLDs. And as of the end of February, two weeks ago, or a week ago, they're at 3.5 million top-level domains. Now, keep in mind, a lot of these are certainly speculators. A lot of these are consumers. These are consumers looking to have a a self-sovereign digital identity. Not so much companies looking to do e-commerce, although you would expect brands are going to follow the consumers uh, into the decentralized web. So I'm calling this mega route because it doesn't quite feel like an alternative route, right? When when we look at the, the relative scale between the ICANN route and the handshake route. And again, this is just the leading decentralized web today. There are several others that I'm aware of that, that, that are just coming out of the, the starting gate, uh, but none have the, the, the growth that we've seen with handshake. I'm gonna pause there real quick before I move on to the next section. Glenn, do you wanna entertain anything? Yeah, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm aware of our time, but you know, I did promise Siva to slip in one of his questions. He's been um, quite uh, generous with his time as well. So let me go back. Uh, 
He, I, I believe you addressed this, but I'll, I'll just do this real quick one. Uh, can you please explain temporarily reserved ICANN route in the top 100,000 websites? So I'm not sure if you addressed that, but I'll repeat it. Please explain temporarily reserved ICANN route in top 100,000 websites. So these are these are strings, just like ICANN, you know, reserve strings for the launch of any new TLD. Handshake also reserves strings and, and primarily designed to be backward compatible with the ICANN route, but also to prevent trademark cyber squatting. And if you look at the top 100,000 websites, this is actually, they took it from the Alexa list. Um, after 20 or 30,000, you don't see many famous trademarks. So it, it covers most of the famous trademarks that, you, that we're all familiar with, the household brands, on this list. And they basically said, you know, we will not let people cyber squat on that exact string, but it's only available to be claimed if you can demonstrate you own the corresponding legacy domain name, be it .com or .uk or whatever TLD you have it on. Um, and so there's a claim process where, again, you need to have DNSSEC, uh, enabled on your domain name, make sure it's not SHA-1, SHA-256 or higher. And you, basically what you need to do is from a handshake blockchain, you start the claim process, you generate this handshake key, and that then gets inserted into the DNS of, of the .com domain, let's say, as a TXT record in the DNS. And then that, uh, that enables the handshake blockchain to verify the, the ownership for that reserved string and then allow you to initiate the, the uh, claiming of that reserved string. So it's typically, if you have DNSSEC in place, it's typically a 30-day process on the handshake blockchain. Can we go to the next slide? So this, uh, this is really our final section. We want to talk a little bit about implications for ICANN and internet governance. So if we go to the next slide again, um, I mentioned this earlier, you know, there's been a lot of comments in the chat about, oh, but it doesn't do this. Oh, but it doesn't do this. And, and they're all exactly correct. We are, we are looking at a very incomplete solution of, of the decentralized web today. Right. When you, when you hear people say it doesn't work on a normal browser, which is really uh, is absolutely correct, you need to add a plugin. Or you find a Web3 browser. It's no different from the, the, when the web first came out. And some, some websites will say, you know, optimize for Netscape or optimize for Microsoft Explorer. The decentralized web websites will say optimize for Opera or optimize for Brave. If you, you are using a web two browser, it simply won't be a great experience for you. And so we're still very early on in this process uh, where before what I call the chasm, where people are willing to uh, tolerate an incomplete solution uh, in order to enjoy the benefits that are being promised by, by the decentralized web. So something to keep in mind. So the question is, what will it take to cross that chasm? Uh, part of it will be uh, the, the browser war that I referred to earlier. But if we go to the next slide, um, I, I, tell, I can tell you what I don't think it's going to be. It's not going to be the policies that we all are very familiar with in ICANN. So those policies are missing as a, on purpose, not as a bug. And so the, the decentralized web is anonymous. There's no who is, no zone files. There's no right protection or enforcement mechanisms. There's no accredited contracted parties like registrars and registries that could be used to enforce a consensus policy. And so instead they're trying to create these decentralized autonomous organizations. And again, there will be dozens and dozens of these DAOs uh, for various ecosystems that are out there. And again, they're all are trying to operate on a community-based democracy type of policy setting. And as a final uh, note here, 
Uh, there is no unified alternative route. So if it turns out, for example, I was not able to get gotten circa in Handshake, well, I could go to an alternative to Handshake and get gotten circa. And then there would be a fight between my target customers, my in circa customers versus someone else's in circa customers. And I would probably say, you use this browser that's optimized for where Dot and Circa lives that I want you to see. And someone else might say, you use this browser because that's optimized for the version uh, of, of my in Circa. And so this is certainly a, a totally different type of regime than we've seen under uh, the ICANN world. So let's talk about a little looking ahead. Next, next slide, please. I just have a few more. So this is my rough forecast of the ICANN route. You know, we, we started in 1995 with roughly 260 or so TLDs, mostly CCTLDs. We added a few through the uh, 2000s, 2005, 08. And of course, as you know, we had a round uh, back in 2010 and started to add additional TLDs to the route. So we're roughly at 1,500 today. I would expect around 2026, we would start adding more TLDs to the route. Um, this is anyone's guess. I'm expecting the route will double in size by 2030. So we'll go from 1,500 to 3,000. And as you know, there's a lot of work being done. It's called route scaling analysis to make sure that uh, doubling the size of the route won't break the internet. Uh, I think they still have a policy not to add more than 1,000 TLDs per year. And so they're very careful in terms of how they scale up uh, the ICANN route. So if we go to the next slide, and let's see where we think Handshake might be by 2030. Uh, I would expect it's already at 3.5 million. By the time the next round starts, I'm guessing it'll be between 20 and 30 million TLDs. And by the time 2030 comes around, uh, ICANN will be at 3,000 TLDs roughly, and Handshake will be close to 100 million TLDs. So again, not quite an alternative route that we think of when we look at the alternative routes today, uh, but that's, that's what the decentralized web will look like. It might not just be Handshake, there could be multiple instances uh, that are uh, doing something similar to what Handshake is doing. Next slide. So where, where does ICANN come in? So as we said earlier, um, they have alternative routes today. They exist today. It doesn't break the internet. ICANN is mostly concerned about collisions to the route that can cause confusion or uh, abuse of some, time, of, of, of some type. And so again, picking on handshake here, let's say the next round is going to double the route. So 1,500 more TLDs. A good percentage of those will probably be in this top 100,000 list. So if those domain name owners, you know, in the next two years claim those strings, there won't be a collision problem. Um, if they're not on that list, they're say a newer trademark or a newer idea, that they could already be taken in handshake or in fact be still be available. But overall, certainly I would expect in the next round to have all those new TLDs collide in some way with a decentralized web. So let's say close to 100% in the next round will collide. But on the handshake side, it, it constitutes pretty much a rounding error, given that there'll be tens of millions of, of TLDs on the alternative or decentralized web. And finally, we talked about the browser war earlier. The browsers and in, in the decentralized web by design are going to alternative routes. So as ICANN introduces new TLDs, if you are using a web browser for the decentralized web, you may not see that new ICANN TLD. You would have to be back on a web two browser in order to see the new ICANN TLDs. The folks who are using uh, web three browsers may never see what ICANN is adding uh, to, the, uh, to the internet.
So Glenn, I'm going to pause there and you've got 10 minutes to. So, can I, can I quickly? Yeah. Go I ahead, just yeah. Quick, yeah. So, so Tom and I have a little bit differing opinion on uh, um, these alternate routes. Um, I uh, am certainly, uh, I appreciate ENS's ability and willingness to work within with ICANN, uh, with the ICANN route. And I think they should be separated from the discussion, um, certainly separated from um, handshake and unstoppable domains. Um, handshake and unstoppable, you know, they market themselves on not being tied down by ICANN rules, ICANN policies, who is, and all of the things we spend so much time discussing here. They don't accredit, as Tom said, registries. There's no standards. There's no, in short, there's no end user protection whatsoever. So there's, there are some in the community that um, are afraid that the longer that ICANN takes uh, in coming up with the perfect new TLD process, the more proliferation of these alternate routes you're gonna have, and the more that the world will have passed ICANN by. Um, I think it's a real concern. In the past with alternate routes, like I mentioned before, whether it was the Atlantic route or the open route or the Chris Ambler, whatever that route was, or real names, those were not big threats. Those did not have any kind of um, take up. This is different. Uh, this is very different from the, from, and from those that were around back then, they know what I mean. Um, a new .NET, as Frank says, was, was another one. This is very different. This has more uptake. This has a number of um, ICANN accredited registrars selling these domains. Um, so this one's not going away like the others. And so we can spend lots of time within ICANN arguing about every detail about who is and everything else. Well, you know, and, and these other groups love that, that we're doing that because that gives them more time to proliferate, and that's their goal. Uh, in fact, I have a, um, I obtained a communication from one of these organizations whose strategy now is to try to get ICANN to delay and delay so that they have more time to get acceptance. Um, this is something we need to deal with. And so one of the top questions that you'll see coming up is, what do we do if a proposed new GTLD in the ICANN route conflicts with one that exists in the handshake route. Tom and I have a very different answer. I would say, well, since they're not abiding by the ICANN rules and they're not playing within the ICANN world, my answer would be, we shouldn't care. If they don't care about the ICANN rules, why should we have to care that they exist? Uh, Tom feels differently, uh, but this, isn't, uh, this is something we need to discuss. So Jeff, let's let's go to the next slide and let's take that. Let's ask the, the, the audience what how they would respond to that. So you go to the next slide, please. So we have uh, another audience call for you to ask you guys. And so let's first start with you know, should I can expand its role to include the decentralized web? So what would people think? Yes or no? We could put up that question. Again. Let's, let's move quick since we're running out of time. You got three seconds. Should I can't expand its role to include the decentralized web? Hard no, David says. Can we see the results? All right, so it's fairly split. 52% of you think, yes, I can should expand its role. And we will, the next question, we'll try to get into what you mean by that. 48% say no. So the next question. Just uh, you can leave some time for the people to answer. You are running so fast that it's not possible. Okay. You uh, don't take into account. Please, Sebastian. Okay, we'll take our time. Uh, okay, uh, we'll read it slowly. Should now poll number two. Should I can differentiate between accidental and intentional collision in the next application round? Answer yes or no. We'll give you a few seconds to answer that. Right. And just to uh, elaborate on this, accidental we consider to be corporate networks like we saw back in the first round. 
that had leakage into the greater internet. So we're calling those accidental collisions. Intentional collisions, we're saying are alternative routes, who, who intentionally went outside of the ICANN standards, basically, and process to launch their own TLD. So okay. the, question, the question is, do, does, is there any differentiation in terms of assessing potential consumer harm if it's accidental or intentional collisions? Okay, I think we gave enough time for that. Can we see the yeah. answer, please? Interesting. So 71% of you believe, yes, we should differentiate between the two. I think this is in line with what Jeff was saying earlier, that uh, we want to make sure we don't reward people who don't, who deliberately bypass ICANN. 29% says we should not differentiate, which leads us to the next and final question. Should ICANN consider potential consumer harm of delegating a new TLD that collides with a TLD in the decentralized web? Yes or no, we'll give you a few seconds. If you need an example, so Unstoppable Domains has a dot .crypto, let's say they have 10 million consumers using dot .crypto as second level names. Should that be a consideration if someone else within the ICANN community wants to apply for dot .crypto in the next round? So three more seconds and we would love to see the results. Can we see the results? So on this one, yeah, so yeah. on this one, while Good the job. results, while the results are being pulled up, um, there are arguments on both sides of this. Um, and if I can um, does consider the potential consumer harm then it could encourage the proliferation of these alternate routes. If it doesn't consider the harm, well, then, you know, end users could be harmed. So, and, and this is actually, the results are pretty indicative of the difficulty of this problem. Right. And so you see 52% believe that um, ICANN should consider the harm and 48% say no. So again, you must ask yourself, if, we, if we're saying that an alternate TLD that picks up a significant amount of users um, should, um, no one should be able to apply for that TLD in the next round, then are we just encouraging people now to go out and start their own TLDs um, so that in four or five years when ICANN does launch the next TLD process, they're sort of grandfathered in. Uh, is that fair? to those that are following the rules. Uh, remember that none of these new registries in the alternate route have any protections, right? There's no, as, as Tom said, no who is, no registrant protections. Um, there's no regulation, there's no diligence done on the registry operators. They can fold the next day, right? There's no escrow, none of that. So this is a difficult um, issue, very difficult. Thanks, Jeff. So, Glenn, we, if you want to stop at the top of the hour, we'll, we'll hand this back to you. I want to thank everyone for their attention today. There's some, some great discussion in the chat. Uh, obviously, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens within the ICANN community going forward if, if this becomes a part of the, the normal discourse. Great. Jeff, any final words? No, I mean, I thank you for um, letting us discuss this. And um, it just shows you that we can't continue to just ignore what's going on in the rest of the world. We need to start, we need to get out of our bubble and we need to recognize that the world is evolving with or without us. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Thank you, this is Eduardo. Uh, thank you everyone for participating today. Again, this presentation is available on of the our social channel. You're free to share them with your colleagues. And uh, let's see if we have another uh, uh, meeting going forward to answer some of the questions that we saw today. Thank you so much. This meeting is adjourned. And thank you to Tom and Jeff. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.